welcome. Yeah, my name is, is Rafael. Um, I'm a data scientist at WhatX. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about data science for IoT with Python and Spark. I added AWS in parentheses just because I realized that I mentioned in quite a few AWS services uh, throughout this talk. So um, this made sense. Um, and what I want to do is tell you a bit, um, uh, a few things on how we went about doing data science on, on IoT sensors. Um, in, with, in, in the context of a smart office prototype that we recently built. So um, I want to tell you um, a few things, um, a few data science -y and data engineering things um, uh, that actually cover the whole pipeline from um, the raw data to pre-processing it, a uh, bit on modeling, and then with the ultimate goal of essentially building um, a smart uh, application on top of, of IoT data. And these are things that for us, um, uh, two tools and, 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 and recipes and, and essentially very pragmatic approaches that for us um, worked very well while working on this, on this prototype. Um, and 30 minutes is uh, way too little to cover everything in detail, but I hope to give you an overview and a glimpse of how we approach things such that if you work with, with this kind of data now or at some point in the future, you get some, some insights or some ideas. Um, to give you a bit more uh, background, uh, let me briefly start by introducing ourselves. Um, we are WhatX. Um, we are a company builder based in Berlin that focuses mainly on the Internet of Things, both for consumer and industrial applications. And, and when I say company builder, I don't mean it in a sense of, of an accelerator or an incubator, but we really do everything in-house from generating an idea um, to uh, actually spinning off uh, a new venture. Um, so uh, we are a team of around 30 people, including IoT engineers, data scientists, uh, UX researchers, uh, business developers, and, and all our, of our projects essentially follow, follow the same process. Um, and that process uh, essentially starts uh, with an ideation phase. And in this ideation phase, we do our in original research in order to, to create um, uh, targeted ideas. And these ideas, we move on into a discovery phase um, where we bulletproof those ideas. We look at the market, we do conduct more user research, evaluate the technologies, and, and really make sure that there is something behind that, that, that idea that we then move into to the prototyping phase. And this, this for me, of course, is the most exciting and the most fun one because this is where engineers and data scientists come in and we actually start building a solution for, uh, for, for the original idea that we had evaluate this idea in the real world with actual customers. And if this turns out to be successful, well, then we create, uh, uh, we spin it off as a new venture, a new startup that takes over the prototype and, and, and takes it into market, productionizes it. So as you see, we work a lot with, with prototyping and move along those, those, those projects in, in a very fast uh, way. And so one of the recent uh, ventures that we found is called SNUC, and, and SNUC is, 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 it essentially provides um, infrastructure for enabling smart building applications. So um, much of uh, what I'm talking about now is what led to, to actually spinning off this company. So these are the four points that I want to go through. Um, first of all, I'll give you a short introduction into um, this smart office IoT um, setup. What kind of data did we use? How did we get it into the cloud? Then move on into, into some pre-processing. What did we do in order to transform the data such that we have it in a format that we like to work with? Um, and then uh, give you an example on how we modeled um, a sensor data that is uh, a machine learning approach to do um, time series forecasting. Here I want to concentrate on, on the, the general approach itself, not, not on the models. And then uh, the last bit would be on scaling and automating things by adding Spark on top of our Python code and deploying everything on, on AWS. So let me jump uh, straight into the smart office IoT setup. Um, here are a few numbers. Uh, essentially, we had access to, to two floors of an office uh, building in, in Germany, comprising 36 rooms, um, and where we installed over 200 sensors, and we recorded data for a period of around uh, three and a half months. Um, here you see a sketch of, of, of one of the floors where the dots denote uh, installed sensors uh, in the rooms as well as, as in the hallways. Um, these are the sensors that we used. Um, those are so-called multi-sensors because essentially it's, it's a single device that contains uh, several sensors, uh, four of them, which are temperature, luminosity, humidity, and motion. 
and those devices we essentially installed on, on the ceiling of, of, of the building. Um, in smaller rooms there was a single of those and in, in bigger rooms we, we installed several of them uh, just in order to, to cover the whole space. And so um, let me show you how the data flow goes. Um, of course the data starts at the sensors and the sensors uh, send the data to, to the gateways. Um, and the gateways are just uh, small computers that are connected to the internet. Um, the protocol used here in order to communicate between sensors and gateways um, was, was C-Wave. That is something that we used back then because we just needed something that, that worked out of the box. Um, but in the future we will definitely go uh, with something different. Um, and then so the gateways, we had one of them per, per floor and the gateway sent the data into the cloud using, using Wi-Fi. And as I mentioned before, AWS is, is the cloud infrastructure of our choice. So in this case, we are using um, the AWS IoT service, which um, if you haven't heard about it, in its core, it's essentially just an, uh, an MQTT broker, which is very common in, in IoT um, um, in IoT in general, and, and this MQTT broker just has a, a few services around it. This is very similar to other um, IoT platforms. Um, the nice thing about this is that um, we can connect this very easily to, to other AWS services. So what did it, we did here is uh, use a Kinesis Firehose queue, um, uh, pull the data out of this broker, and simply pipe it into S3. And S3 as being our, our blob store where we essentially um, uh, stored all our uh, raw sensor data. And this for us was the starting point for, for the data science, the science team to come in and, and start working on, on, on this kind of, uh, of sensor data. So um, let me move on and, and show you a bit uh, of the data and what we did in order to pre-process it. Um, here you see a snapshot of, I hope you can see this well, yeah. Um, this is a snapshot of the raw data, um, and e essentially one data point consists of, of three values, a sensor ID, a timestamp, and a value. This is uh, essentially very common for, for, for time series data. Um, that is what we call the observations format, because essentially each row is one observation of a particular um, sensor at a particular time emitting um, a certain value. And um, it has to be noted that um, our, these sensors, they don't send uh, a data point um, at regular intervals, but most of them are configured such that um, they send a new data point once they sense a change uh, in, in whatever they're measuring. So um, a temperature sensor is not saying every minute that the temperature is 25.1, but it says once 25.1 and the next data point is, is whenever uh, the temperature that it senses uh, changes. Um, and so what this means in terms of raw data is that all of our sensors, um, across sensors and within sensors, um, the timestamps are very, very irregularly. Um, and and this, uh, this becomes important in a minute. Um, on top of this, of this uh, raw data, um, what we also have um, in the cloud is, is essentially a metadata file that for each of these sensors gives us some meta information such as of what type are you, what floor are you installed in, in what room, um, are you online and offline. Um, so of course this is information that we need um, and instead of, instead of sending it with, with each coming data point, which, which would be just highly redundant and a huge overhead, we just uh, have this, this metadata file that, that gives us uh, this information that we then later can use to do simple group buys and let's say retrieve um, all the data of all the sensors within um, one room, for instance. Um, and so what we do in, in terms of, of pre-processing is um, that we go from, from this observations format that has this three column structure of sensor ID, timestamp and value, and we pivot the data such that um, we end up with a data frame that has a single daytime index and each column now um, represents all the values of, uh, of one sensor. Um, this, this is a very natural way to, to think and to work with, with, with this kind of data, I think, um, because um, all the values of, 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 of a single sensor are just um, um, aligned in time uh, within uh, one column. And the key point here is actually that um, now all these timestamps um, that I just mentioned are completely irregularly to start with. We unify them and we align them in order to have regular intervals between um, these sensors such that we can 
easily say, give me all the values of, of all the sensors in this room this morning at 9.15, um, right, uh, without to have without having to deal later on with converting timestamps and 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 changing them and aligning them and all these kind of things. So um, the key the, the the crucial operation that we need to do here is is for each sensor resample the data to go from this irregular timestamp format uh, to to a, to a single one. Um, and if we talk about resampling and uh, we live in a Python world, then um, ultimately we end up with uh, pandas because uh, pandas has this very nice resampling functionality where um, essentially for any data frame or um, serious object that is daytime index, you can simply call resample, give it uh, the new interval that you want it in, um, provide a, a, um, a resampling method, in this case it's, it's the mean, and your resulting um, um, data will be in this, in this new uh, frequency. Um, to show you just a, um, a toy example, um, this is just, just a line, think of it as, let's say, temperature rising or something. Um, this is a daytime index, it has a frequency of 30 minutes, and so let's say we wanted to go from these 30 minutes to to, to seven minutes, well, then we essentially just call resample, say uh, seven minutes, use the mean as resampling method and uh, interpolate linearly between the resulting values um, because uh, in order to fill essentially non gaps um, that result from going f uh, from, from, a, from a higher frequency to a, from a lower frequency to a higher one. Um, the difference between um, this uh, sort of uh, uh, toy data and our sensors, as I mentioned before, is that our sensors don't have a particular f a starting frequency to, to, to start with. So it's, uh, it's, it's very irregularly. So by doing these resampling operations, sometimes we are actually upsampling if the sensor data is, is very sparse or, or depending on whether it's very sparse or very dense. So we get very um, uh, different results across across um, the census. Um, and so um, what, uh, what we did here is a very simple trick of um, doing this resampling in a two-step process where we first um, upsample all of our sensor data to, to a very high frequency, let's say a minute, and then downsample again to, um, to the desired frequency that we actually want to end up with. Um, and and this, works, this works actually very nice. Uh, so in this case, it will look something like uh, upsample everything to a minute, again use the mean as resampling method, interpolate linearly, and then uh, because our, our target frequency is seven minutes, um, we downsample again to, to this target frequency, and now we forward fill because we're going to from, from, a, from a high frequency that is one minute to, to, to seven minutes. Um, and so uh, apply it to, to actual uh, data, um, this is a temperature curve, uh, uh, the blue one is the original data, and then you see that the resampled points, in this case 15, 15 minutes, um, match uh, the, the underlying um, data very well. Um, here's, here's another example of a noisy sensor where you have these periods of, of, of very sensitive periods of a sensor jumping between uh, two values, and then you have these periods of, uh, where, the, where the sensor is constant. Um, and again here, applying these resampling um, to, to this um, um, uh, regular frequency uh, works very well. Um, and so the da data that we end up with, this time series format, essentially has this, um, uh, this uh, daytime index and, 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 and the columns now are the sensors that we then simply can join arbitrarily as we want and, and work with them together. So um, this, is, uh, this is what I wanted to say on, on, on resampling for us, a, a very important step to do before we move on in, in, in order to, to actually start working with the data. We have it clean, we have it in this format. And so um, the third thing I want to talk about is, is um, applying machine learning on the sensor data and um, specifically um, use a machine, le machine learning approach in order to do time series forecasting. Um, so this project essentially for our uh, data science team was the first one in which we had to deal with, with time series data, so we didn't know too much about it, but we were very, very familiar with, with Python, essentially experts in, in, within the Python um, data science stack, uh, NumPy and Pandas and Scikit-learn, the usual suspects. So we were thinking ourselves, 
how do you now go about of using that knowledge of, of like how we've always done data science and modeling by using one of the scikit-learn models? How do you actually apply it on, on this kind of uh, time series data um, in order to do forecasting? Um, and so here's the here's the the approach that we took. Um, and I want to show you this uh, with the example of, of an occupancy predictor. So uh, predicting occupancy in a room is simply saying for some, time, for some point in the future, I want to I wanna know is this uh, room going to be occupied or not. Um, so uh, we have these, these intervals of, of um, hourly intervals, let's say, of, of occupancy values and at time point T, that is now, I want to know, is this room going to be occupied one hour from now? What about two hours from now, three hours from now? Um, so what we end up with is um, a binary classification um, problem with multiple steps ahead, okay? Um, and so if we, if we would to, to formalize this, then we could end up with something like this, where we have some, some historic data, um, some, some axes, can be motion values um, or other features, and we want to learn this function f, this model that can be essentially any scikit-learn model, and uh, predict for a certain step in the future, is the room going to be occupied or not? Um, but we don't want to do this for a particular step, but for multiple steps. So um, here's three strategies that we used in order to approach this. Um, the for first one would be the, the, the direct step um, approach, where essentially you, you, you train a model in order uh, to predict um, one step ahead. And then you train a completely separate model in order to predict two, two steps ahead, and so on and so forth. So for every um, step ahead that you want to predict, you, you have a separate model. Um, the downside of this, of course, is that you end up with, uh, this is computationally very heavy, because you, for each uh, new target, for each step, you're training a new model. And if you extrapolate this to, to all the rooms um, in, in, in your building, um, you end up with, with, with a high number of, of models. Um, and the second downside is that essentially you use this uh, predictive, uh, this, this uh, temporal dependency between predicted values because the prediction at t plus 2 doesn't know anything about the prediction at t plus 1. It was uh, trained and predicted completely um, independent from each other. So um, another approach that you can take to, to do this is uh, through, through iterative steps. Um, and what you do here is you, you learn a model to predict the next step um, and then you, use, uh, you predict that step and you use that prediction and feed it back in into the model at, in order to predict the next step and so on and so forth. You do this for, for as many steps as, as you want to uh, go forward. Um, so now we have only a single model, but um, the downside of this is that, um, that you're essentially accumulating an error as you go into the future because you're always using the predicted value to feed it back in into, into to your model to predict the next step. So as you go forward, um, uh, the prediction error um, goes up. And so what we ended up doing is um, the third strategy, and that is multi-labor prediction, where uh, we state the problem the same, but now we are not trying to predict a binary, binary value, but, but an array of binary values, where this array essentially are, are all the targets of, of, of the, the steps ahead that, that we want to predict. Um, and so nice about this is that um, this can be actually used with any model that, um, that supports multi-label prediction. Um, and in scikit-learn, there's quite a few of those. Um, and, and what we ended up with, what we ended up with then doing is, is simply implement an occupancy transformer that, um, let's say, um, having some, some uh, motion data um, uh, computes some features for us, uh, gives us the data in this format such that we can train an algorithm this way um, and, and feed it into a random forest classifier that actually supports um, multi-label prediction uh, out of the box. Um, and and this, this actually works uh, very fine. Um, there's, there's this guy named Thomas Huskins. I, I don't know him myself, but I think he's Dutch. Uh, so maybe the community here knows him. Um, and, and he wrote actually a very nice blog post on, on exactly uh, time series forecasting using this machine learning approach. Um, where he goes through these different strategies and, and uh, so if you want to go into this, um, I really recommend reading this. It's very nicely written, very simple um, and it gives you a good idea of, of, of what I just uh, talked about. Um, 
just to give you a preliminary result, uh, here's um, the AOC values of, of one uh, of our predictors um, for a particular room um, six hours uh, into the future and the corresponding um, uh, uh, AUC values. Of course, this is cherry pick. This is one of the rooms for which it uh, worked pretty nice. Um, I, actually, so um, there's there's quite a f quite some variance um, across rooms because if you think about a, a very common uh, office uh, room where where someone comes in at eight and then stays until twelve and then there is uh, an hour of lunch break and then there's another five hours of of being occupied and that goes on five days a week. These, these regular uh, occupied rooms are very, very easy to predict as compared to, let's say, a meeting room. Um, and we had other um, funny incidents um, of, of rooms being occupied during the night in the kitchen. Um, and it, it essentially turned out that uh, apparently uh, the, 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 the night guard uh, liked to hang out in the kitchen for a few hours. Um, so, yeah. Um, and uh, we had we had another another funny incident where in two of the rooms we installed a, a net atmo device which essentially tracks um, the CO2 level um, and we were building applications around it so uh, on a Saturday night we got we got um, a, uh, a notification saying that uh, the CO2 level was two times higher than the recommended values and it turned out that the office was having a party at that at that evening and uh, that's why um, that was the case. Um, I guess, yeah, I still have some time. Um, let me uh, let me move into the last part, which is um, uh, automating and scaling. So the the way that we work in our data science team is um, we 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 work locally. We use uh, pandas and scikit-learn and work in our Jupyter notebooks and um, work on a subset of the data. Say um, you know train one of these predictors for a room um, or on a few sensors um, and so on and so forth. But what's missing in order to actually build um, a smart application is now to take these these different steps uh, that we now build of going from raw data to pre-processing it to um, training a predictor to doing actually some predictions and so on and so forth, um, automate this in a pipeline um, and, and, and actually run this on a regular basis because for each new coming data we want to actually update our models, we want to, we want to retrain them, we want to do uh, new predictions and so on. So. Automating is is crucial here, and the and the other thing is um, scaling. Um, if we if we train uh, an occupancy predictor, we don't want to do this for for a single room, but essentially for all the rooms in our office, um, independent of whether all means two or thirty six or a few hundred. Um, and so um, what, what worked out for us here very well is the combination of uh, using uh, Spark on, on, on top of EMR. Um, I assume that you all know Spark, um, or you know what Spark is, let me put it that way. Um, and uh, EMR is, is the Elastic MapReduce um, service on AWS. And what it actually allows you to do is simply bring up a cluster, a uh, Hadoop cluster, and run um, uh, Spark applications, for instance, on top of it. And that's how we use it. Um, and it has this very nice functionality where you can actually programmatically uh, tell EMR, bring me up a cluster, run all these steps, uh, all these Spark applications in this order, and when you're done, take the cluster down again um, automatically. So by using EMR, we're actually achieving um, this, this automation because we have this pipeline of, of different um, uh, tasks that, that we can um, run. And, and by doing this in Spark, we achieve uh, scalability um, for, 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 this, for this prototype. Um, and the way we use Spark is not um, that we re-implement whatever we did in pure Python, uh, our scikit-learn models. We don't re-implement them in Spark because our, our problem so far hasn't been that the data of a, of, 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 of a single room doesn't fit into a, a single node. So if that's not the case, we don't need to re-implement things, but we actually use um, Spark um, and its, its power of, of parallelizing things in order to do what we did for a single room across all the rooms in, 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 in the building, or uh, we parallelize across uh, um, excuse me, uh, sensors, depending on, on, what, on what we're trying to achieve. So let me give you a very simple um, and boiled down example of how a Spark application uh, looks like 
that, that such that you get an idea of how we use it. Um, of course, we use uh, PySpark, and, and for those of you who, who have used Spark before, you know that the first thing we need to do uh, when we build the Spark application is initialize the Spark context, which is essentially our window into to the Python world, um, into the Spark world, sorry. Um, and, and then we have this, this, this function that um, for all the rooms in, in, in our building just uh, gives me all its motion sensors. So let's say we want to uh, train uh, an occupancy predictor based on, on, on historic motion values. So this room um, census variable, what it essentially is, it's just a list of tuples where the first entry is the room ID and the second entry is a list of, of motion sensors. And what we can do with this is simply parallelize it in Spark. And now we end up with an RDD uh, of key value pairs where the key is a room ID and the value is this list of, 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 um, of motion sensors. And now for, for whatever we did locally on a single room, we simply apply it on this RDD. Um, and, and, and in this case, uh, for instance, uh, a function that loads some, some sensor data and then uh, a second one that um, for each entry of this RDD uh, trains a predictor and, and serializes it somewhere. Um, so this, this is a sample Spark application. Of course, this is very, very boiled down to, to a minimum. There's more to it, but just for pres presentation purposes and to give you an idea on how we use it, um, I, I, I made it, um, I comprised it a bit. And, and now, now we, we actually um, implement all these Spark applications that, that go through, that essentially do whatever we want them to do and go through, this, through the steps. Um, and now we want to run those in, in, on EMR automatically. Um, and for this, we can, again, um, use, use Python. Um, and if you have worked with AWS and Python, the, the library to use is, is, is BOT 3 um, And um, in order to talk to these AWS services, so what we do here is um, we get uh, an EMR client uh, that talks to the EMR service. And um, we run this uh, run job flow uh, function, and that's 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 a very nice function that essentially does uh, what I told you before. It it brings up a cluster, runs a number of tasks, and then brings the cluster again uh, automatically. Um, and so in this case, I'm I'm just creating a cluster. I'm telling it give it this name. Um, I want this many nodes. Um, uh, of, of this uh, instance type, and there is actually much more uh, configuration to this that we actually use. Again, for presentation purposes, I'm boiling it down to the minimum. And then the two uh, important uh, steps here are these bootstrap actions and, and, and job steps. And the bootstrap actions essentially are just uh, very small scripts that uh, you run in order to, um, to configure your cluster um, such that we use it, for instance, just to install our Python libraries across all nodes of the cluster. So if we're using scikit-learn and pandas, well, then uh, we use bootstrap actions in order to, to um, to, uh, to install those libraries. And the job steps are the actual Spark applications that are then being run in, in this order. Um, so this is, this is an example of the job steps. These are two Spark applications, one that does the conversion from observations to time series. Um, this is uh, parallelized across sensors in our building. And the second one is uh, parallelizing across rooms and for each room uh, an, an, uh, a Spark application that trains an, an occupancy predictor. Um, here's an example of the bootstrap actions. It's actually only this um, install libraries shell script and what this contains is literally pip install and then the libraries that we actually want to use the dependencies of our uh, Spark applications. It's really um, as easy as that. Um, to put everything together, uh, you already saw this, um, the, our data that goes from sensors to gateways to AWS IoT, Firehose, and ends up with, with S3. And then the second part of this data flow could look something like this, where um, we have S3, um, we, we, run, we, we load the data, we run these, these uh, EMR jobs, um, parallelize our Python code using Spark um, across sensors or rooms, and then, for instance, we uh, save uh, predictions that we do. We save them into DynamoDB, um, and, and we can plug in a... Um, a, a small a Flask API in order to serve those predictions. Of course, this, this step in the end, it just depends on the use case uh, that you have of whether, uh, of wh what you're actually using your, your smart, smart application for. So uh, that is all I have. Here's a summary of the things I talked about. I'm just gonna skip through this. 
Um, I just want to mention a few things I did not talk about, um, uh, things that we are uh, working on or uh, aiming to work on. Uh, one thing that I did not talk about is stream processing. Um, so everything uh, that I mentioned was, was essentially batch processing. You, you take uh, big chunks of data and you, you, you um, um, process them that way. But for applications that, that require more, uh, that where time matters actually, we're starting to look into um, uh, Spark uh, streaming, uh, Apache Flink, and, and these kind of technologies that, that enable this. Um, then um, I mentioned before how we use Spark, that we are actually not using it to, to, uh, for, 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 for its, uh, using its actual libraries, but just to parallelize our scikit-learn code or scikit-learn models, for instance. But of course, as data grows or as we are building models that don't only use the data of a single room or of a few senses, um, but it gets as big as, as it doesn't fit into a, a single node, then we, we, we start uh, re-implementing things in, in Spark and actually making use of, of, of these technologies uh, much more. Um, Third thing is modeling. I, the, the, the approach that I mentioned is just one of many in order to do time series. Um, and, and there's more traditional ones such as Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. Um, we want to look into LSTMs that are very suitable for time series data. Yesterday there was a talk on deep learning on, uh, on time series, which was very nice in order to classify time series. Um, uh, time series curves uh, called McFly. Uh, this is something um, we definitely want to check out. And then the last bit is actually closing the loop and using these uh, these smart these predictions that we are actually producing in order to control a device. So um, one of the motivations for cre for uh, creating such an occupancy predictor is to actually use those predictions and control the heating of a room. If we know that someone's going to be there in this room in one hour, and we have temperature models, so we know how long it takes for temperature, given a current condition, to reach a certain level, um, then we actually want to control the valve of a radiator, let's say, in order to, to heat um, or cool down a room. Um, all right, this is really all I have. Um, I feel like I talked so fast. Um, I hope I didn't lose too many of you uh, in the meantime. Um, thanks for being here and thank you for your attention.